for programming this morning was that first we'd have Rick do the religious service, and then we'd have a little fun. <laughs> so Shabbat Shalom. Um, the idea for this session arises out of two things that I've been complaining and whining about for many years. The first thing is that when people talk about settlement, it's usually you know thousands and thousands of people living centuries in the future. I want to go settle the solar system right now. You know, at first there weren't thousands of people at Jamestown or Plymouth. You know, and after Columbus discovered the trade routes, it didn't take many decades before we had the first settlement. In fact, I looked it up. The first permanent Spanish mainland settlement was in 1510, 12 years after Columbus finally managed to find the mainland. Now, you know, we love these analogies uh, about, um, <clears throat> we love these analogies about, you know, the age of exploration or um, the Western expansion. But, you know, of course, there are really good reasons, and Rick alluded to those, about why settlement to space is taking a lot longer. You know, nature didn't provide us with trade routes to low Earth orbit. And when the Europeans found the trade routes, they already had very capable seagoing ships and all that infrastructure. But it's been 51 years since Yuri Gagarin, and we're now building pretty capable ships. They're still a little expensive, but we're working on that. And I see no reason for us to wait much longer. I think most of the people in this room would agree that if we started right now, we could have first small settlements in about 20 years. And we're going to talk about doing that in this session. The second thing that has always annoyed me thoroughly is the notion that O'Neillians aren't interested in Mars. Now, I'm about as O'Neillian as a person gets. You know, like Rick and a number of other people who are here this week, I had the privilege of knowing Dr. O'Neill personally. And, and, and you know, I, I can assure you that was a really wonderful experience because Jerry was a genuinely wonderful human being. And I think that the misunderstanding that we don't like Mars kind of comes from the, <clears throat> the, the, the subtitle of the book, which in this edition you probably can't even read. It says up there, human colonies in space, and the fact that we love to use these pictures of these great big colonies. And that reality that Jerry spent a lot of his time and energy thinking about um, very large structures in free space. But the core of this book, what this book's really about, is using the resources of the solar system to solve the really big problems that confront human civilization. And as a result of that, O'Neillians want to settle the solar system. We want to settle the entire solar system, not just the moon, not just free space. We want asteroids, comets, Titan, and of course, Mars. We want to settle everywhere. Now, I obviously can't speak for all O'Neillians. You know, this joke goes around that uh, <clears throat> if you uh, have three O'Neillians in the room, you have four unreconcilable opinions. Um, the, and, and there's a lot of truth to that. But to me, Mars is the logical first place to settle. And my reason is that there just might be something on the surface of Mars that's really, really interesting. There just might be life, or at least might have once been life. And if there is, or even if there was, that's a profoundly important discovery. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and <clears throat> possibly even the most important discovery of the 21st century. Anyway, last year at New Space 2011, uh, the third co-founder, Jim Muncy, partially addressed the first complaint when he did a, a lunch talk on talking about how um, <clears throat> the kids had me partying way too late last night. <clears throat> he did a, a session on how settlement is a verb. And of course, Rick has been annoying everybody about his Space Settlement Act for the last year or so. And over the winter, I got to thinking that, all right, maybe we ought to you know, actually start doing something about the two things that have been annoying me. And Meanwhile, 
so, so over the winter, I, um, I recruited a few other people, and we cooked up a thought experiment that we could use to try and make sense of all this. And I went and I pitched it to the conference team, and they kind of liked the idea. And meanwhile, Rick was badgering them about wanting to do something that he could use to introduce Earthlight. He wanted it to be disruptive, out of the box, audience participation thing, you know. And, you know, and they kind of pushed the two things together. And here we have this session. Now, our thought experiment requires one gigantic assumption, one suspense of disbelief, which is that Capitol Hill was pop populated by people of vision <clears throat> who wanted to settle Mars. Now, we know this is not true. Okay, we know it's not going to be true anytime soon. There's no chance the 112th Congress is going to pass the bill that we would like them to pass. There is no chance the 113th or the 114th is going to do it either. But we have in this country had Congresses capable of visionary action. The 84th Congress uh, created the interstate highway system by passing something called the Federal Aid Highway Act. The 69th Congress um, commercialized airmail and stimulated a young airliner industry by passing the Kelly Act. And the 37th Congress stimulated the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad with the Pacific Railway Act. And I'm pretty sure that I'm not the only American out there who isn't, who's not pretty disgusted with the current state of the US Congress. And maybe that'll change in eight or 12 or who knows how many years. But for now, what we're suggesting is clearly impossible. And for a thought experiment, that's a good thing because it's good to be, have something there that you know, makes it um, a little unreal. And we're asking you to suspend disbelief, but only for that one fact. For everything else, we're going to get beyond that one assumption, we're asking you to stay very close to reality. No radical technical, no radical new technologies, no unanticipated discoveries, no gigantic budget increases. So, if a visionary Congress really did want to settle Mars, one way they could go about it is, oh, you did it, okay, um, is our, well, you can do it. There's only two slides, only three slides. <laughs> yeah. um, the government pays a billion dollars for each of the first 12 US citizens to live on Mars for one year. In addition to that $100 million per colonist, in addition to that $100 million, $100 billion, excuse me, per colonist for each of the following 10 years with a maximum annual payout of $2.4 billion per year. And then we have bonus prizes for the finding of extinct life and extant life. And I, I should, one thing that may not be completely clear is you can't win both of those bonus prizes. Obviously, if there's extant life, there would also be extinct life. So if you find the extinct life first, you only get five billion when you find the extant life. Now, there's a huge, okay, this is a lot of money. I, 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 I can't, you can't quickly add it up, but if you do add it up, it comes to a maximum payout of $46 billion. Um, yeah, Congress could really do that, right? But there's, if, you could, if they would, there would be a gigantic return on equity you would have at least 24 people settled on Mars. All the accompanying infrastructure needed to get them there, keep them alive, and find life. And the scientific return that comes from having 48 of these and 24 of these living on Mars. And we have a series of questions that we're going to ask you over the next um, rest of this session. And no, for other. Oh, yeah, we got others. Okay. And the, um, but I think before we start on the series of questions, we should probably go back to the previous slide. And, no, nope, wait, did you give them the questions? No, I haven't shown them, no. Show them the questions. I've got them. Oh, one at a time. Yeah. Okay, so before we go on to the I questions. I got fancy. Oh, you got fancy on me. <laughs> I, you know, Rick can like sort of ad lib these things. I need to prepare. I didn't actually see this stuff till 10 o'clock last night. So go back to the previous slide, Rick. And I want to know if any of you have any questions about any of this before we go on and start asking you questions 
about what it is we're going to be doing here. Uh, before we go too much further, I just want to remind our online audience that uh, we will also be taking questions online or comments. I'll be monitoring them from here and can interject uh, if there's a good one. Only if there's good ones. <laughs> <laughs> Relative. Okay, so does anyone have any questions about, you know, about our, our thought experiment, about the parameters that we're using, or is it all really clear? We tried to make it clear. Got Ben? So we have microphone runners? Or, uh, if you're pushing for settlement, uh, wouldn't you want it to be a two-year prize rather than a one-year prize, since the standard like Mars mission that everybody talks about is 18 months already? So if you're going for settlement rather than just a there and back, wouldn't you want it to be like two years and then you get a billion dollars? Um, that gets into the there and back question, which we will talk about in a minute. So. And, you, and you'll notice there's bonuses for staying for 10 years? Right. Mm -hmm. why, don't we, why don't we dive in? Okay, let's go right into the questions then. Okay. Will they ever come back? We're open to your thoughts. That's the whole point here. We really don't want to do a show for you. You're the show. So, any thoughts? This gentleman right here. Got two of them. I think maybe, and it'll be probably a mix of that. I mean, when the French fur traders came to the New World to get their beaver hides. That's kind of what it's like looking for life. Some of them stayed, some of them died, and some of them decided, well, my five-year tour is up, I'll go home. I think it'll probably be a mix, and picking the crew to do that might have to reflect what choice you think they're going to make, and some are obviously going to change their minds, I would think. Huh? Al? Yeah, please <laughs> wait for the microphone. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, if you pick a big prize like this, you could very well get it. But once the prize runs out, where does the money come from? Where's the market? Who are you selling what to? Right? The, and I, I think if you really want a space program that has legs, that really goes out and, and colonizes a solar system, you need to spend your money on stuff that will turn into industry, space solar power, tourism, asteroid mining, stuff that has customers on Earth, because that's where all the customers are. So the companies that might be involved in this, or it was presuming it's companies, I'm not saying it could be universities, could be whatever, not the government, that are going out and putting these people up there should be looking at what they're going to do after the first year. Or after the first 10 years. After the first 10 years. Keep in mind, they only get 100 million, was it 100 million? 100 billion. No, 100 million, million per person afterwards. You keep saying billion. Oh, okay. 100 million. 100 million. So they're going to get 100 million just for being there afterwards. So you're saying they need to focus on generating revenues. Any other thoughts in that area? Coming back, what are they going to spend their billions on if there's 24 of them? If you're on an oil platform, how do you spend all that money that you have? Okay, that presumes, of course, that they haven't spent all of that money just to get there, A, and B, that they're coming back, right? Go ahead. Well, Wait for the microphone, please. If you're shouting out. People on the web can't hear you. The universe is locked out to you. I think since the search for life is one of the opportunities to win such a large benefit, you'll have a large percentage of microbiologists. And Mars represents a really great opportunity to do synthetic biology, which is perhaps one of the scariest forms of microbiology uh, you can do in terms of what might come out of it. So if you wanted to isolate that from Earth, that would be the place to do it. And that might be one of the economic drivers that would support a colony. Okay. Bob, just to my little clever idea of doing them all one at a time, I'm going to put them all up. Go ahead. Because that way, if something you see down the pike that we're going to get to, you won't have to get ahead of things. Whoop. There we are. So Rick, could you go ahead and just read all those off? Yeah, the first question will be, and we're going to hit these all in order, uh, will they ever come back? What will they do with the money? How will they get there? Would this be good for NASA? What role would NASA play? Is the search for life the right rationale? And would it be moral for them to have children? I wanted to add number eight, what would the children's names be? But um, <laughs> would it be moral for them to have children? So we're going to go through these one at a time. We're still on number one. Any more thoughts on number one? Uh, OK, we have two. Go ahead, Mark. You know, the fundamental problem with uh, all the schemes of Mars colonization that I've seen, including this one, 
is after you get your initial base or small group of people there, which you can do by any one of a number of means, including this one, or simply have NASA spend $200 billion to do it, uh, there's no obvious economic return or product for that colony to continue to exist. I mean, there's been a lot of colonies uh, that have been uh, put, put various places in the past which died because the people decided it was better to move elsewhere. Um, so if you don't have some rationale as to how to make money after the, I, I can buy the government or for any number of reasons, spending some money to set it up and then writing, off, writing that off. Um, but you've got to at least get enough benefit so the people are going to stay there after the initial base is set up. And so my question is, what is your plan for ensuring that's going to happen? What is your plan? This is about you. This is just a thought experiment. Keep in mind, this is not some initiative we're going to go out of here and do. We're just trying to get you thinking about some of these ideas, you know, and, and these questions may or may not be the right ones. This is just us sitting yeah, I think you're dodging the question, Rick. <laughs> no, I got an answer for you. I would call it Florida. Retirement. People want to end their life someplace where they can get around under one-third less gravity, and it's kind of cool, and they're, you know, so Florida. Anyway, go ahead. But it's not my job. I think initially you'll have a large group of people staying there, but some have to come back and share their experience with people on Earth and get people excited about what's going on there. You need that personal interaction. They could broadcast back to Earth, but in reality, if they get out amongst people and talk about what they've been up to there, that's going to create huge excitement on this planet. And there's going to be 24,000 people within 10 years. Okay, so I want to yeah. rephrase the question slightly. Will they have the ability to come back? Mm. Will the people who win the prize have the ability to come back? Yeah, one of the original phrasings of this was that, and then there was a sub-question or a point under this, is it a suicide mission or not? Just, if I may elaborate, it, bear in mind that if you're planning a mission that has the ability to come back, you may be competing with people who are planning a mission that does not have the ability to come back. And who would win? Okay, we have two here. It sounds like you're framing it around money for search for life and Mars being the best place to do that. My suggestion would be why give it to, <coughs> sorry, take Mars out of the picture and just make it living in space for the year or more and let the people work out what they want to do unless you specifically want to tailor it around a search for life. The question back to you is what's the public purpose? There's a public purpose in searching for life on Mars. This is government money, this is taxpayer dollars. Is there a public purpose that is as compelling for living in free space? Good question. Gentleman right here, Mr. Osterweet. And then we've got another one over here. I wonder if some wouldn't take that, some of that money and say, I want to build a, a bit, another colony here. I want to bring more people here. Mm, okay. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna create an economy, you might need more people. So, I'm gonna create some more consumers. So it's in, in a, I'm not gonna use the word pyramid scheme, but it's basically the idea of you're <laughs> just adding more money, more money, more money, more money as more and more people get in. It's all going one way. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people out there. Go ahead. We'll come back, Elvis. I think to some degree, from a, from a designing a, a vehicle to get there standpoint, you want to have the ability to bring people back so that, as some other people mentioned, they'd come back and sort of evangelize about, uh, about their experiences. Because you don't, you know, you get the government subsidized first 24 people or whatever that go there. Um, but you still want to be able to kind of make more money off of the system that you designed. So it'd be in the government's interest, your point is what you're saying, to make sure that maybe there's a clause that says you have to bring them back? Or? I, I don't think so, but I think if I were designing a system to take people to Mars, 
I'd want I'd want some abil the ability to return some people or some materials from Mars, um, both because they might make some cool stuff, and those people would be my best PR people to get more people to go. Okay, we'll do one yeah. or two more on this, and then we'll move on. We've got one over here, and then we'll go with Al. Tied up with a bow. I think uh, one of the detractors from for the general public about uh, living and working in space in general is that it's a harsh environment and a lot of times you're alone. Uh, back in the prospecting days for California in the gold rush, everybody at least had the option to come back. So I think the option should be there. Uh, the model for the frontier back in the day worked in that, in that sense. You could always come back, you don't necessarily have to, and a lot of people didn't. Uh, I think that'll be the most successful one. Go, uh, well, I think Al had his hand up first, but go ahead, we'll get. We have somebody else go with them, but I think that's All somebody right. that has to cover the other thing. Yeah. Okay, because we're going to move on to the next point. This, this lady over here then, and then we'll go to the next point. And, uh... Since we're going with a thought experiment, I was thinking that going back to the premises, uh, why not open up the competition even within government? Um, I don't know if you have heard of the concept of charter cities or free cities or city institute in which you could actually develop a competition in which be more, more multidisciplinary and actually having people laid out a plan and have found a city with its own set of rules in Mars. And one of the primary motivations for people is freedom. I mean, you can offer freedom, like you will actually be free if you can come up with a plan in which you will develop the technical capabilities and all the other institutional arrangements for actually make it livable on Mars you may get a, have a go. That's an uh, interesting thought. Kind of opens it up a bit. Why don't we go ahead and go to the next, Bob? Go to the next point, shall we? I'm, I'm running this one, so. Where's the button? Here you go. Well, we don't need a button. Have, yeah. They're all up. Oh, they're all up. Right. So what's the next point? Yeah, what are they gonna do with the money? What they, would you do with the money? You know, they, 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 somebody started to allude to that, but would, the, would they just, give it back to their investors? Would they use it to bootstrap to something else? Would they be interested in sustainability? I mean, you know, the government's stimulating to get this started. Do they want to stay permanently? I mean, do they care? You know, who's doing it? Why are they doing it? And what they do with the money, I think, is a very good question to get at their motivations for why they're competing in, you know, in trying to do this. So yeah, is, it, is it you know a bunch of billionaires going forward? Is it corporations that want some sort of branding opportunity? Is it a mining company that thinks there's something we don't know about that they're going to mine? Is it a real estate company that's looking at creating the next Las Vegas on Mars or, or Florida? Or, you know, rest uh, elderly homes or whatever. Um, you know, wh what's their motivation? There was one back there. So uh, if I was doing this, uh, I would put the money into the return trip. <laughs> You know, maybe you don't buy your return rocket until you actually get there and spend a year. Um, and I would market this, you know, to some of those doomsday preppers out there because they're already sp spending millions of dollars to prepare for the end of the world, right? So make your self-sustainable base on Mars. Okay. Very cool. Any other? There we got one over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I guess one of the questions, you know, that kind of springs forward is, um, you know, what's quality of life going to be like that, you know, you can have, you know, is this going to be a city on Mars and it's going to be a really kind of cool place to hang out in, you know, why the hell would you want to come back? Or, or is it going to be, you know, 10 guys, you know, huddled around, you know, some Quetzal hut on, on Mars, you know, freezing their buns off, you know, you know, waiting, waiting for that plant to, you know, um, ripen so that they can have something to eat. So. So one of the things about what they might do with the money is, what's it going to cost to keep these people on Mars? So one, you got to get to Mars, but are, are they going to take all the stuff to sustain themselves for this period of time with them? Or especially if they want to stay for 10 years, probably going to have to bring something from Earth, and what's that going to cost? And could you afford that for $100 million a year? So it may cost you some big chunk or maybe more than $100 million a year just to keep somebody on Mars. So to me, this is kind of an economics thing of, uh, uh, again, if you can get the infrastructure in place so that the cost is low and you can take a lot of stuff with you or, you know, you can take additional stuff to Mars real cheap, you know, like Elon's talking about, if you can really, if you could really go to Mars for $500,000, and I assume that's a round trip, but maybe it's one way, 
um, then supporting somebody on Mars isn't that big of a deal. We do you know, stuff like that all the time in, in weird and wonderful places. But if it does cost you, you know, in the, if you use the cost models today, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars to keep you know, that group of people on Mars, then that whole amount of money might just be eaten up just by trying to keep those people alive. Mm -hmm. So then the other revenue sources start to become important. Mr. Shackleton. Yes, sir. Uh, I believe you'll find that the questions that we're asking here are going to be isolated by the time the opportunity arises to actually uh, undertake these uh, missions. Because the infrastructure that will be present by the time we're able to uh, execute on going to Mars will mean that we have such extraordinary momentum that teams will get to Mars, whether via this uh, process or another. Multiple teams will be landing on Mars probably within 12 months of each other. 24 months down the line from there, probably another three will arrive. Within five years, there may be 10 or 20 separate groups landing at that time. As that's happening, there will also be reaches out beyond uh, Mars's purview uh, towards the asteroid belt, etc. So I have a feeling that we're, we're asking these questions, of course, now from a context of uh, isolated assumption. But at the point 2030, uh, when this, this is uh, perceived to be happening, there's going to be a rolling frontier uh, across multiple destinations. So I think uh, it's going to be very exciting. And I think these questions will actually have a wider implication for multiple destinations, not just Mars. Do you think they'll be redundant? I'm not redundant. Moot by then? Yeah. That we won't need it? We'll already I, be I out think, there. All this will be I think on. the questions won't be moot. The, the questions will simply be um, a fait accompli. Yeah, OK, we're going to find that out. But actually, um, we're going to Mars. I'm actually doing three months on Ceres afterwards. You know, it's <laughs> going gonna, gonna to almost be that kind of frame set. Not, not to be trite about it, but I think just as we say, in, say, 1840 uh, or 1860, yep, yeah, I'm off to um, uh, the West to check out some gold. Oh, and then I'm going to head up to the, you know, head up to Canada along the West Coast or something a year later. It, it was, there was no leap or separation of capability. Once you were able to reach one destination, there was nothing technical or technological stopping you from reaching the next one. And that's when you had the capability to get to that destination. Mm -hmm. the, the, both the last two speakers came close to a question that we deleted at 10 o'clock last night, which was to s survive and find life on Mars, would they need telerobotic support from Martian orbit? You know, what is the infrastructure that's really required to do this? And that also relates to the question of you know, how would they spend the money? We have one uh, with Charles. Were you raising your hand? Oh, you, you're good? Over here? When you see the hand go up, get the mic to him. We can keep this thing clicking. Well, you know, I think one thing that um, I'm, I'm a geologist, so uh, I think a little bit about energy. Um, I think that the expansion is always related to resources and energy. Um, you know, the, uh, you can start a, a village with a campfire but you have to have distributed resources and energy to create a city. So, and the same thing with expansion. I don't think we'll get to Mars until we can harness the energy of water in, in space, uh, re the resources of the minerals in space, those type of things. And I think that's the, really the first step is to release the cheap energy. You know, we can't get there with hydrocarbons. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm an oil and gas geologist, but you just can't get there with the energy resources we have on Earth. You have to create the energy resources in space, and that'll get you to Mars. That'll get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's more methane, in, um, there's more methane on Titan than, there, than we've ever produced on, on, on the Earth. Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> so, you know, that's... Yeah, so a lot of the money is gonna have to go into developing the sustainable activities they need to keep going. Let's go to the next question. Uh, uh, how will they get there? So we can keep, keep a clip going here. How will they get there? What, what systems do you foresee? What entities? What participation? What, what do you see? How do, how do they get there? 
you know, is it Red Dragon? Is it Mars Direct? Is it the, the Aldrin Cycler? Uh, you know, what do you think works for this kind of a, amount of money? Anybody? Then we got a gentleman there. Well, we heard a lot from Eric Anderson yesterday, and I suggest we follow the money. The objective state of the entire operation, as was just pointed out, is in space. And the objective state of where is the money going to be spent is not in space or on Mars. It's going to be spent on Earth to make all that happen. Now, eventually, when they have an economy, there will be another set of circumstances like that. But if you look at the business case and you look at the business plan, those guys yesterday, the Planetary Resources Group, showed us the way, in my opinion. <coughs> So, so I'm going to ask a follow-up question. So you're saying that they'd go to Phobos and Deimos? I'm saying that they'll go wherever there's a business case and a result associated that with that will be the economy that flows from that. I think Bob's making the point that Phobos and Deimos are asteroids. So the with, business case that PRI is making? Very low delta V to Earth. Yeah, they're easy asteroids. And you get Mars along the way. Anybody else? Okay, next question. <laughs> Bruce? Oh, I'm sorry. Would this be good for NASA? Kind of interesting question. You've got this going on. It's a government activity. Government funded. Government funded activity. You got NASA. They're still there. Would it be good for NASA? Yeah. What he said. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? We knew that might be one of the answers. Yeah, you predicted that one. Yeah. All right, well, uh, anybody else? What do we got? There we are. I, I know that there's a lot of us who say, who cares what NASA thinks, but I think it's something that we all really need to think about as we push towards commercialization. You better care what NASA thinks, and you also better care who writes the check for NASA, because if it looks like we're just gonna go in there like we do in Afghanistan, kick down the doors, blow everybody up, and just go kick ass, that's not going to happen. All we're going to do is alienate them. They're going to fight harder their way. We're going to continue to push harder our way. And we're not going to come together, and we're not going to get the solution, I think, that we all want to. It's not saying that they're going to have the biggest role in it. They might only support us with their technology and the, 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 the things that they've developed, the technology, uh, the innovation. They're going to help us get to where we need to go. So would it be good for NASA? Yes, but I would also say, it definitely matters what they think, because if we continue to alienate them, I, th I think we, we might end up making our job a little bit more difficult. It is great to hear the voice of moderation coming from the Tea Party. I just think that's awesome. <laughs> um, <clears throat> four and five, why don't we kind of roll those together? What role would NASA play, and would it be good for NASA? Because that's kind of what you're, we're playing with there. So. Uh, 20 years ago, I went to a book reading with David Brin, and I asked him, you know, what do you think the future of NASA is with the sp uh, spaceship freedom? And he said that um, it's probably going to kill NASA, you know? It's like they're going to put so much resources into this one project that there's not going to be anything left for anything else. And we see SLS. That's another case of that. I think NASA understands in certain factions, we, we see evidence of that, that at Ames, that uh, they have to reach out into the commercial sector and form partnerships. That culture is starting to spread through NASA. They're starting to understand that they need to work together. They can be the innovative force for space exploration. They have the resources to open new doors and let the commercial sector follow. So I think NASA needs to play a key role in this whole situation. It's the best way to apply our tax resources to opening up the frontier. The question, I, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bob. I, I just want to point out that our rules do not forbid government from, from competing, from partnering with teams that are competing. This is not necessarily not an entirely not, this is not like our cat's prize, this is not necessarily an entirely non-governmental competition. Mm -hmm. NASA could be part of it if they want to. And it's interesting because, you know, you have to deal with the issue of NASA now the pacing entity. In other words, do we have to wait for the NASA astronauts to go explore and say that it's cool and now we can send these 12 people up there? Or does this negate that and just completely fly by it? And say, no, we can't control the other parts of the private sector. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, see, there's a, there's a, there's a, 
diversion here between the impossible thing that you assumed about the Congress coming up with this money and then Andrew, uh, the Tea Party delegation saying, come bring up reality <laughs> that NASA's institution is going to be around. You know, so I mean, if we're going to assume some impossible things before or just after breakfast, I mean, <laughs> what, 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 I before mean what's the point? I mean, yeah. in other words, you know, I mean, on, on, on my scale, it's, it's, you know, would this be good for NASA? Who cares? Well, what role would NASA play? Well, that gets it's getting into the details that, you know, follow from an impossible assumption. I mean, if you want to say, what role would NASA play um, uh, if this were possible? Is that, I mean, you're yeah. saying that if, what, if it were possible to the Congress to do this, what role would NASA play? But that's going back into the realm of the possible. Well, let's, let's talk about that for just a second. You know, um, and, and it kind of gets to the pacing point I was making earlier. The, the fact is, the Google and X Prize is about sending robotic vehicles to Mars, which 10 years ago would have been a completely NASA activity. So yeah, we're, we're in the realm of what was impossible 10 years ago. So yeah, this is impossible now. But we're crossing over. The exploration function is being handed off here and there. So it's, it, but, your, but your point is good. But what? The money award. You know, okay, at, yeah. at that now level is, you know, is the impossible thing I was thinking of. <laughs> right, okay. No, it seems like NASA's role would be like a lot like it is now, doing basic research, being, doing basic missions, you know, to, to explore places robotically and that type of thing, uh, to, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, uh, doing basic scientific research. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, commercial. You know, if there's a commercial reason to go someplace, NASA doesn't do that well. You know, because they don't have the, you know, they don't have the um, the reason or the. I think it's an interesting it. question, Bob. I mean, the money is outside of NASA being managed by an outside entity, right? Or it could be managed by NASA. Either way. So if it's managed by NASA, NASA is going to have an interest in making sure that they look good all the way through. Yeah. Okay. And it could either come out of their budget or not. Okay. Let me get clear on that. Um, Aaron. Well, you, you preempted me, Bob. What's that? You preempted me. I was going to raise that specific question, being, being you know, the policy government guy, does it come out of NASA's budget or does it come, to, or does well, it come? Which, I mean, you know, if, if you were writing the bill, which way would you do it? I think it would be more interesting if it came out, came out, came out of, an, of a different sector of the government, I think, in many ways, because it forces... There's the same problem. The story reads, it, it's, it reminds me of the problem that space solar power faces. Oh, that's space. That's NASA's domain. Oh, that's energy. That's the Department of Energy's domain. If you throw it, if you throw it outside of NASA, I almost want to say that it, 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 it forces other sectors of the government to say, we have to care about this for, because we've got $12 billion, it's got to be managed. And National you not, Academy? And you would not have NASA manage the prize. I think, I think, I think, to a certain degree, I think NASA's not, NASA's fundamentally the wrong place. They don't, I, you know, I think they're, they're, to put it bluntly, they're a bunch of engineers who, they do a really good job with the engineering. You don't necessarily always want your engineers, you know, managing your money. Okay, so the National Academy of Sciences, Department of Commerce, you know, God forbid the military. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> We have uh, hands. We have hands in the back. Oh, there we are over there, Mr. Leahy. Couple, uh, three quick points. Uh, one, I, it's interesting to me that your proposed budget is um, about three times the existing NASA budget right now. So that's that's well, a that's over a ten year period. Oh, okay. I, I stand corrected. Uh, but uh, let's see. Two, uh, that you're going to be if you're going to make this habitable for a dozen people or whatever, you're going to have to uh, send a lot of stuff, and you know. Here's point number three, which I'm sure Rick's going to like. I'm sure NASA would be happy to help develop a heavy lift launch vehicle if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, uh, very funny. Um, 
Yeah, we were talking about like who would go, and we figured a bunch of people would go like, send Zubrin, send <laughs> Mike Griffin, one way, big rocket. Now, uh, one, uh, one point too we, we really didn't mention is, keep in mind, first of all, as I, I think I mentioned uh, earlier yesterday or something, um, the people of the United States have already agreed to spend 14 to 15 billion per year on space, number one. How much is it now? 18, I gotta get up today. Uh, 18 billion dollars, uh, I was thinking of something else. And then um, on top of that, if you subtract from that the amount of money we actually put into ex extended over time, Mars exploration, um, you know, and you add that up over the same period of time, in other words, how many rovers, how many whatever we would have sent, and if that were money were all poured into this, it starts to actually kind of reduce the apparent scale of the amount of money. Go ahead. There are smaller things. Uh, NASA can do that are relatively painless, uh, like the ILDD model, the Innovative Lunar da Data Demonstration. I mean, uh, what was amazing about that was not only how short a time it took to uh, institute that, and for those who are unfamiliar with ILDD, it basically is NASA putting in place a, a small program that says any private companies that uh, uh, either get to the moon or on the way to the moon do certain things that uh, provide data to NASA that NASA doesn't has never accumulated before. And NASA will pay certain monies for it, up to in this case thirty million dollars for ILDD. Uh, one of the amazing things about that was that the NASA procurement bureaucracy loved it. The head of procurement, ben, Bill McNally, uh, at the end of the session where he approved it, said, "Bring me more of these because they don't cost me any upfront money." I, you know, we uh, definition are paying for data that NASA doesn't have yet, which this would generate uh, in the process of getting people to Mars and then on Mars, and uh, only have to pay money once NASA gets the data, and the risk is all on somebody else's side. And in fact, to set up ILDD, I think, cost all of ten thousand dollars to set up that thirty million dollar effort on NASA's side. So, so uh, in a in a sense, the the 10 billion for the discovery of extant life and the 5 billion for the discovery of extinct life on Mars is you're paying after the fact for what would normally be a whole set of missions and poking holes and sample returns, et cetera. You're only gonna pay after they've either confirmed or denied the existence of life. So, great. Someone data else, purchase. Someone else on hearing about this uh, brought up that same analogy and pointed out that um, given the, the structure of the prizes that we have, and NASA might be concerned that they would bypass Phobos and Deimos, and NASA could do a data buy for pho pho data about photo Phobos and Deimos, which would then motivate them not to bypass Phobos and Deimos, which of course NASA has a great interest in, but the, the structure of the prize doesn't really encourage them to do it much. Okay, one more question on this, and we'll move to the next question. The role of NASA. Yeah, just a question for Rick. You, you mentioned Walt Anderson earlier in the Earthlight Foundation and, and fines, and I'm really concerned about that in the sense that um, Walt's uh, financial dealings are, are what destroyed fines in the first place, and I'm, I'm wondering why you feel confident in, in going back to Walt for money. Well, first of all, I didn't say I was going to go back to Walt for any money. Oh, Second okay, of all, so why did you bring that up then? What was the I, I just wanted to point out that he's coming out, and I think okay. uh, that he's a, a great guy and done a great service, and we need to, uh, and he's, to me, one of the heroes of the cause. Um, the second point was uh, that what destroyed fines in the end was the dot-com meltdown, his dot-com money. It was well, years later that the other stuff happened. So. Yeah, I mean, part of it is that um, he used fines to funnel money to take over a telecom company in, in Pennsylvania, and Fines got 700,000 shares, which then he put up for a loan, which he defaulted on. And that destroyed Fines, and it, it basically put you out of a pretty well-paid job. Um, it was a good job, a sweet job. First of all, that was tried in the courts. I'm not gonna try it on the stage right okay. now. And oh. uh, the findings are what they are. They're on the record. Uh, my job was to give the money away, so I had a great time doing that. But. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's all out there, it's all in the record, so that's Okay, it. I'll, I'll be covering that next yeah, week. But thanks for doing the media thing. 10 minutes, next. We will uh, go to, is the search for life the right rationale? 
Um, Rick, we actually got one of our, our online questions uh, submitted that was uh, directed at that. I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit of commentary. The real question is, how do you confirm that you found um, ex extinct life and how do you prevent fraud? Uh, I'm sure you've read Deception Point by Dan Brown, uh, who's endorsed, you know, we have our special cover almost with that book. Um, how can you prevent a team from burying some life that we found on Earth in some rock and melting it down and saying, oh, we found life that came, f that f was on Mars, and really they just cheated and they got $5 billion. Yeah, first of all, Deception Point, he mentioned, Dan Brown wrote before the, uh, what's the one, the Demons and whatever it was, uh, the, uh, Dan Brown wrote a book called Deception Point about a, uh, a, one of the core tenets of Deception Point was that there was a not-for-profit group trying to set up a president who was going to cancel NASA. And at the beginning, in the frontispiece of the book, he says, the Space Frontier Foundation is a real organization. Yeah. So that was us. And it was kind of cool. Um, how do we do it? Or bring it up. Anybody want to dive in? This is you guys. Yeah, I, I'd like to turn that question around to the audience because we, we were, how would you we were anticipating fraud? that question. And uh, um, I've been thinking about it some, and I don't really have a good answer. How would we prevent fraud? Got one back there? Go ahead. How do they, pro how do they prove they found life? Yeah, how do they prove it? <clears throat> we have a structure for finding things out and then verifying them and showing that it's not something that you made up. It's called science. I, I, I think we can handle that part <laughs> of it. <laughs> yeah, but they're on Mars. <laughs> and we're here. How did, you know. <laughs> So you'd have to have a second team prove it? Uh... Is it repeatable? <laughs> now NASA gets to jump in gear, go out there and grab the second one and prove the first one we tried. You know, I'm not so sure if this would be a way to prevent fraud, but I think if someone were to spend all the investment to go all the way to, to Mars, um, it would be pretty difficult for them to be able to, to fraud that. I mean, they could say that initially, but I mean, this community as well as the science community should be very skeptical until those samples are returned to Earth and actually tested out, just like Ben brought up the scientific method. So um, in those types of cases, I think that you know, if someone actually were to get to Mars, um, which of course is going to be us, um, that we should remain skeptical until we actually did bring it back and get a chance to get our hands on it. Bob, you want to talk about your feelings regarding sample return? Yeah, I, would you have a couple if, of? If they find extant life, would they be allowed to bring it back? You know, that's an argument for building up a lab and people, et cetera, on the Martian surface, because you're not getting back contamination. I mean, particularly if it's DNA-based life, you know, or something, imagine, say, something that, you know, likes to live on the, uh, an invasive that likes to live on the surface of ice in conditions kind of like uh, Antarctica and is dark in color. Would we let that on the planet? Would we even need it on the planet? Well, if you want to we have us take it to the ISS and put our space, space uh, or our, our test lab on the ISS or some similar station, maybe just maybe not ISS particularly, but maybe a specific station we're going to, to destroy after we verify that the life actually exists, just to prevent the possibility of contamination. That's right. It's an option. Yeah. Out. Well, I wanted to talk about the, the thing we're back, but going back to that, as long as your people come back from the ISS, the, the bugs are going to come with them. Okay. It's a suicide mission. We're coming up yeah. pretty but, close here. Should yeah, we but I have, I have my, go ahead. Well, well, I'll, one, one is, I'll is com in. Combining the next two, no, because it's not clear that necessarily putting people on Mars is the best way to find extent life. Okay. For one thing, you get a lot of contamination. And two, the answer to number seven is the right answer, which is absolutely that's the point. That's to have children. Oh, number seven. That's okay. the point. If you don't have children, you don't have settlement. So I think we just jumped to number seven, Bob. We just jumped to number seven. <laughs> well, let's talk about that one. Would it be moral for them to have children? Sir. Um. This is somewhat related to this question, but it's more about the economic support for the colony. You could send women who would be willing to be surrogate mothers, who for 50 million or 100 million dollars might have a child for some couple on Earth that wants to have a branch of their family started on Mars. Um, within the past 10 years, it's become possible to freeze uh, human eggs. Um, 
uh, you know, I, you could send frozen embryos, but I wouldn't recommend sending them through interplanetary space. But you, you could support a colony perhaps by having billionaires' children. Just a suggestion. Interesting. I saw a hand. Was there a hand over here? Or? Nope. Here we go. Uh, okay, there he is. Okay, and then this one right here. Okay. Well, I wanted to go back to question six momentarily and address that directly. Um, I think the uh, search for life, while it is very important and very interesting, is not a fundamental question that we want to address. Um, humanity needs to expand into the cosmos whether or not there is other life out there. And if you are searching for a monetary incentive uh, for activity on Mars, perhaps something that would be uh, further uh, human expansion onto Mars would be something like uh, some number of millions of dollars to establish a, uh, a cache of uh, some metric number of tons of water in a cistern like the Freeman of the Desert, something mm -hmm. like that. Thank you. McDoon reference. Go ahead. Uh, to go back to the children one, having children on Mars, um, moral, yeah, why not? I mean, they had, when the Europeans came to the U.S., it wasn't a question if it was moral or not to have children here. Um, there's, is there any other biologist here? Am I the only biologist? Oh, we got more biologists. So you can't lie. Go ahead. Okay. Um, there's a study out now, uh, well, there's a, a genre of research called epigenetics, which is a study of um, children, you know, in, inside the mother. Um, embryos and how they respond to the environment that the mother is in and undoubtedly when we go to Mars the children are going to be different than children of Earth because the mother's environment is Martian and it's a third the gravity and so osteoporosis a sort of bone loss that sort of thing will be different on those children the same as Native American cultures who now have McDonald's don't have to worry about where the food's coming from and, and diabetes is rampant through that community so I think we're going to see some things like that where the ch children will be different than earthlings in that way. Since, since we've, we're hoping to find biologists to answer these questions, so how likely do you think it, that the children would be cripples? I don't mean cripples on Earth, but cripples on Mars. Well, radiation might do something with meiosis and mitosis, um, especially when it's a couple cells that are getting it in, in the embryo. But if they survive, and there's going to be an evolutionary process to it, some are going to be better than others, the ones that do are going to be for a you know, Martian environment, you know, a third the gravity, and so forth. Um, they'll probably be cripples a little bit, maybe, and unless we do studies on the ISS with microgravity or the moon or Mars, we won't know. It's funny, I've I'm, I'm got an advanced copy of Alan Steele's book. Uh, it's called... Uh, what is it, uh, Pirates of the Moon or something yeah, like that? And, and like the main character is a kid who has what they call lunar, uh, lunar disorder. And he, because he was conceived on Mars and he lives uh, on the Earth and he has to use a wheelchair. I mean, these are the kind of questions we have. Are we, are we talking about speciation? Are we talking about homo margialis, you know, arising, that kind of thing? Um, it's a very interesting question. Uh, we need to start wrapping it up. Are there any, just kind of the whole list, any thoughts? Um, you know, I love the fact that you're talking about the rationale maybe other than um, the search for life. This kind of takes us back to what I was talking about before. Maybe the rationale is purely, we're going to go settle it. Okay, go ahead. Anybody oh, else? Any thoughts? I had a question. Yeah, I'm over here, Rick. Oh, there you uh, are. Good morning. I'm Alexis Flippin. Uh, one, one overall comment about this conference, you people are just far too positive. Now, I study risk for a living. <laughs> and, and one motivation for exploring other planets, um, there is some research coming out even from Stephen Hawking that we are approaching a time when we actually are at greater risk of remaining on the planet than leaving the planet. So we really need to start thinking, think more negatively. Those of us in the, in the risk world think in failure space. So there are other, re while it's very cool and interesting to go, there may be other actual reasons for going. And with regard to speciation or Propagation. I think the things we've done at NASA, you know, or, or good science, you use animal models or infrahuman models to uh, see what you get before you go and and try it at the human level. So, so my comment is there. Other than uh, searching for life, 
uh, we may need it to go to save our own lives at some future point. Thank you. Point. Eggs in all in one basket. Point. Uh, back of the room, and then this gentleman in the purple shirt up here, Burgundy. Just my kind of overlying thought on all this is that for us, the search for life enables the discovery of ourselves. The more do we discover about our neighborhood here in the solar system and how life could possibly exist, the more we're going to learn about ourselves. Just like when we first went to space and actually saw the Earth for the first time in all of its glory and changed our entire viewpoint on ourselves and, and everything that we know. And I think that's the reason why we need to do this, is to discover ourselves. So again, the rationale can be more than or different from the search for life. This has to be the last one. Yeah, we have to do the last one here. Just coming to the uh, last point there of having children, Darwin said there's only two things that drive animals, including humans, and that's survival and reproduction. And throughout history, where governments have tried to invade on either of those two things, the governments have failed. So children will be born on Mars if we can get humans there. Okay. So I want to thank you all for, uh, for coming. Uh, a couple of points I forgot to mention. If you're interested in the Earthlight uh, mission and activities we're going to be doing, we'd love to talk to you. Yes, we're looking for funding. We're also looking for volunteers, people that can work on the different activities. Uh, we'll be announcing the conference down the road. Um, I want to thank Ben uh, for uh, he made it sound way too simple how we got to this session. Uh, <laughs> Mars would have been easier. Um, and, uh, um, and I want to thank Bob for uh, coming up with this great idea. Let us know what you think about this. Maybe we'll try this with some other thought, some other idea. Uh, by the way, the term thought experiment, did you mention Gordon Woodcock? No, I did not mention Gordon Woodcock. Gordon Woodcock. Yeah, that's Gordon, yeah. That's the, Gordon Woodcock, he he's one of the uh, you know, Apollo program heroes from Boeing who used to, he would get this look on his face and go, I have a thought experiment. You're like, oh, we're in trouble now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rick and Bob. <laughs>